Hi, I'm Brad Knox, and I'm going to talk about a framework called Tamer that learns control from explicit human feedback, and specifically an implementation of Tamer on a robot. Uh, this work was all done jointly with Peter Stone, and the robotic portion is, is also, uh, Cynthia Brazil was also a collaborator. First, I'm going to talk about the Tamer system, just introduce it briefly and give, give an overview. And then I'm going to talk about that implementation on the robot Nexi. But first, let me talk about the overarching research goal here. Uh, and that's that we want to empower users who may not have technical training to customize and teach new behavior. The number of applications is, is vast for this, this broad uh, problem. Uh, it includes uh, things like having assistive robots, training video game characters, and also working on an assembly line with, with robots and, and needing to, to customize their behavior. There are a number of different ways that robots can learn from human teachers. I'm only going to talk about the first one here, learning from scalar feedback, but there's also learning from demonstration, often called imitation learning, and going by specific forms of behavior cloning or inverse reinforcement learning, learning from advice, uh, and, and, and so on. There's some others as well. First, let me give a somewhat of a hand-wavy definition of human feedback. The hand-waviness, I think, is uh, somewhat necessary because we are talking about uh, something with a human element. And so the hand-wavy part is about what the humans are actually, what their mental model is and what, what, what it means when they give this feedback. Uh, but we mean uh, communications of approval, disapproval, reward, punishment, something in that kind of sphere of ideas of positive and negative uh, feedback signals that can be intuitively mapped to a numeric signal for the evaluation of agent behavior. So I don't mean advice and I don't mean demonstration. I just want to be clear about that. Uh, I'll also briefly note, uh, I used to call this human reward. Uh, that specific terminology didn't catch on and I might accidentally refer to it as that. And uh, I think at least one diagram has it written as that. To give a sense of, of what this uh, learning from explicit human feedback or from human feedback looks like. Here's a Tetris agent uh, acting randomly, just randomly choosing piece placements. Uh, and here's a training session where after a placement, the black box at the top left will flash red when a negative one uh, feedback is given and a green for a positive one. And feedback can be given from the time of the placement to the time of the next piece's placement. And if a button is pushed, so if, uh, if a button is pushed multiple times, that's a stronger amount of feedback. So the label for a placement, uh, if I push the positive button twice, two green flashes would be positive two. If I push the negative button once for a placement, then the, the label would be negative one. Um, so that's what the interface looks like. And you should be able to tell it's already doing better than random. Not fantastic, but better than random. And here's after two games of training by an expert trainer. Uh, in our in our actual experiments, we don't have expert trainers, and they are also uh, more often than not able to train uh, behavior that at least qualitatively meets the the threshold for for looking like successful training. And one thing I won't get into here in, in detail uh, is that teaching with Tamer, uh, much like teaching from demonstration, uh, can often get to good behavior much, much more quickly than, than standard reinforcement learning algorithms. So the first part of the talk here is going to be introducing our system for learning from this type of human feedback, which is uh, Tamer. You can see on the left here, the typical diagram for uh, reinforcement learning agent environment interaction. Uh, the agent takes actions that changes the environment state. And then uh, that's new states communicated to the agent along with a reward uh, that provides feedback on uh, on that action and state. On the right is the Tamer diagram, and you still have the agent on the bottom, environment top right. There's now a human who can see what's happening uh, in the environment. The agent is acting in it, and then the human's giving delayed reward, really feedback. There's the the reward sneaking in, uh, delayed human feedback, and there's three main modules that the Tamer agent has uh, as, it's as it's acting in the environment and receiving this human feedback. The first is the credit assigner module. So the credit assigner module 
exists because of a recognition that people uh, can't react instantaneously. So there's going to be some delay in their feedback. And uh, so the credit signer roughly takes a feedback signal and spreads it around on recent state action pairs. The end result of this is a, a sample for every state action pair where the input, this is a supervised learning example, the input is a state and an action and the output is a, a human feedback after modification from the credit assignment. The supervised learner can be really any regression algorithm uh, and it's going to output this reward model that the action selector uses to, to, to select actions. And what that action selector does is it says, okay, here's my state. And for every possible action, uh, I'm going to query the reward model that's been learned so far. And whichever action is expected to get the, is predicted to get the highest human feedback value, that's the action I'll take. So the action selector is greedy with respect to predictions of human feedback. And I'll also just mention that the need for algorithmically driven expiration is much lower with Tamer because the human trainer can give negative feedback to actions they don't want to see, thus driving expiration because the agent then chooses new actions. It's worth noting that maybe the most salient and important feature of the Tamer framework is that it turns what seems to be a reinforcement learning problem into a supervised learning problem. And I think that's that's part of what allows it to, to learn more quickly in many cases than, than reinforcement learning algorithms using uh, regular environmental reward. Tamer has been implemented successfully on a, a number of simulated tasks, some by us, some by uh, other groups. And uh, I won't talk about any of these in any further depth. Actually, I'll mention Atari Bowling uh, was an extension to, to deep learning. And that's, that's definitely an interesting paper to look at. And None of those tasks are robotic. And so one of the big questions is, will Tamer work on, on robots? So I had an opportunity in the summer of 2011 to be in the MIT Media Lab and implement Tamer on the robot Nexi. So here's the task environment. It's very simple. Uh, all that really matters here is the training artifact in Nexi. The training artifact is what I'm holding to my chest. It's picked up by the Vicon infrared camera system that's circling around us, the red glowing things. And um, what we draw from it is these two bird's eye view state features. The state features here, there's two of them. It's just the distance and the angle to the training artifact. Nexi here has its arms out, kind of like a zombie, uh, just to make it clear which, which direction is forward. And you know, in the actual experiments, Nexi's arms are just hanging down. And the actions, there's four of them, turn left, turn right, move forward and stay put. And the reward interface was a presenter's remote where uh, the right and left button were positive and negative uh, feedback signals respectively. There is a button for toggling training on and off. That's an important feature of Tamer that I think a lot of people end up missing is that if the trainer's done training, it's a very small implementation, a line or two to be able to just turn learning off and, and have it act according to what it's learned so far. And then also there is a safety button because sometimes next would start to run into furniture and so on. And that would just force the stay action. The, the core things for Tamer's implementation here are that we did regression to create the, the model of human feedback by key nearest neighbors. Uh, and the time step durations and the target velocities are, are shown here as well. And I'll talk a little bit later about these time step durations. We taught five different behaviors, and this is really the second goal of the research. So the first goal is to show Tamer can work on a robot. The second goal was to show that it can flexibly train different behaviors without changing the code, only changing what the trainer's doing. Um, and before I get into those five behaviors, I wanna talk about the novel aspects of this being a robotic training task. So we had some early failures in training sessions that were based on lack of transparency about what the current state action pair is. So you kind of think of this as trainer agent mismatch about what the current state action pair is. And this took two different forms, the start and the end of, of actions. What happens here is, you know, Nexi's acceleration is not particularly high. So if Nexi goes from staying to moving forward, say, 
there might be, uh, just to throw a number out there, a half second where Nexi is not has not accelerated enough to actually know that the current action is to move forward. So Nexi looks like it's in a stay action even though it's moving forward. Um, and so the solution ended up being just to lengthen the time steps. I think something more elegant could probably be done. But basically by lengthening the time steps, then you know, like say for moving forward, the time step was a second and a half, maybe the first quarter or half second, it was, it was uh, technically moving forward, but not visually moving forward. But then the rest of the time step it was. So that means a large portion of the time step, the agent's action is also the action that the trainer thinks is the action. The second one is the state of the training artifact. This Vicon system would sometimes lose it. And early on, this created some very confusing results of learning. And the solution ended up, after really digging into it and figuring out what the actual issue was, was to add an audible alarm. So whenever the Vicon system couldn't detect the artifact, and therefore the robot couldn't detect it, there was an alarm. And that allowed me as a trainer to, to quickly move the training artifact so that it would be detected and possibly turn turn training off for just a moment. I think it's it's really worthwhile to mention here that these problems are very similar to what are called correspondence problems in imitation learning or learning from demonstration. And those are where the demonstrator's state space or observation space and their their action space can be quite different than the agent is going to be learning from their demonstrations and, and performing the task. There's a lot of thinking about that problem that, that's interesting to read on. But I think it's interesting that it's very similar, and but it's a little bit different that for learning from human feedback, the issue is about the trainer's mental model of what the current state action pair is. All right, so here's the first of the five behaviors, keep conversational distance. The robot's task, uh, the, the correct behavior was to turn towards the artifact and then move towards it until the artifact is at a reasonable distance to have a conversation with. So kind of pretending it's a conversational partner that you're approaching. So I'll first talk about turning left. So this is a representation of the model from bird's eye view. Uh, in each case, we've got Nexty again with the arms forward. And so this is if based on the state where the training artifact could be to the left to the right, behind or in front of Nexi, what's the prediction of human feedback if the actions turn left? Uh, so this is the same thing if the actions turn right and so on. So for turn left, uh, what we want Nexi to do is if the, if the artifact is over here, it should turn left. If the artifact is over here, uh, turn left's not a very good choice because that's turning away from the artifact. And, uh, and so, we actually do, oh, so we actually do see that the feedback, the predicted feedback reflects that. Uh, we see green, which is uh, bright green is highly positive, uh, black is near zero, and red is highly you know, is negative. Um, bright red highly negative, and we see that when the artifact is to the left, that Nexi expects to get positive feedback, highly positive feedback for turning left. Um, so that's, that's good. We see the mirror image roughly for turning right, which we would want. And then for move forward, we see this bright green area for when the artifact is in front of Nexi, but not very close. And the bright green for stay is when the artifact is in front and close. So that really fits kind of if you're just going to code up the behavior, uh, as I described it while talking about it up here, it really fits that pretty well. But with, with some noise and kind of jaggedness to the model, one thing that I think is worth mentioning is that, so move forward here does have a prediction of positive feedback if the artifact is far to the left over here and Nexi moves forward, but it's not as bright green as turn left. So it's not actually going to move forward if the artifact is over here. It's going to turn left instead. And actually the jaggedness uh, is going to be denser where there's more feedback. So you can see that it's not that dense. So there actually wasn't a lot of feedback here, um, which means that probably it mostly did turn left when it was supposed to be turning left uh, in that area. Okay, so here's a video of training. And what happened is randomly, Nexi chose to stay first. And you can see the white box there indicates that. And so what I do as a trainer is, I think in the paper we call it reward painting. I take the artifact and I move it to where stay is appropriate. So you can see I'm kind of at a conversational distance here. And I'm giving a lot of positive feedback here. Um, 
Then I'm going to move to where it's not appropriate in just a moment. So watch. Uh, I've given a lot of positive for where it should stay, where Nexi should stay, and then I move away where Nexi should not stay and give a negative. And that makes Nexi try a new action. And so I repeat the process doing a reward painting by moving the artifact to all the areas, uh, you know, just a representative sample of the areas where Nexi should turn left. So see, I'm to the left, and Nexi should turn left towards the artifact, giving a lot of positive feedback. And then once I feel that I've given a lot uh, and, you know, in a variety of situations where Nexi should turn left, then I move to where Nexi should not turn left and give a negative piece of feedback, making Nexi choose a new action. And so this is kind of the process um, to train each action. And then the rest of it is kind of testing for little, you know, the remaining errors and, and giving more feedback on those to, to sharpen what it's doing. Um, and at the end you can you can see the um the model looks like like what we just looked at in the last slide here are the four other behaviors so we have go to which is almost the same as keep conversational distance but next he goes all the way to the marker instead of stopping the, the artifact um instead of stopping at a conversational distance look away uh is where next he just always looks away you can kind of see i'm dramatically uh acting like next he won't have a conversation with me Toy tantrum means that whenever the toy is not right in front of Nexi, it kind of randomly gyrates back and forth like it's having a tantrum. And then my favorite magnetic control is uh, where if the marker is to behind Nexi, then it acts kind of like an opposite pole magnet as if it's pushing Nexi to move forward or, or turn left or right. And one interesting thing here is that uh, through human feedback, I actually end up training control interfaces. So especially with magnetic control and go to, uh, I'm using this artifact now to control what Nexi does uh, to, to some level. And so you could potentially use uh, this control interface then to do demonstrations and kind of this like hierarchical or, or two-step uh, manner. We never really developed that idea further, but it, it remains intriguing to me. Here's the training time. On the left, we have the actual time that Nexi's learning. The right includes time of just observing the learned behavior. And go to is a lot longer because it's the first of the five. And there, there was a learning curve as a trainer there. Here are the five predictive models of human feedback. You can pause it if you want to take a closer look. Just a review here from the talk. What I covered, other than the intro to Tamer, is a description of how the system for learning from explicit human feedback could be applied to a physically embodied robot, including some of the challenges that were observed and, and what was done to overcome them. And then the second is explicitly demonstrating the flexibility of teaching by explicit human feedback, uh, which we hadn't done previous to this, but showing that five different behaviors could be, could be taught. And that ends my talk. Thank you for listening.